Good morning. Good morning. So honored to get to be here this morning and just begin to deliver the word that God has placed in my heart. Uh, we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 42 this morning. It says, One day some teachers of the religious law and Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want, to show, we want you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. But Jesus replied, Only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on Judgment Day and condemn it. For they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. The queen of Sheba will also stand up against the generation on judgment day and condemn it, for she came from a distant land to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now someone greater than Solomon is here, but you refuse to listen. So here we are this morning, and we've been going through the book of Proverbs. We've talked about the wisdom of God. We've talked about the foolish man and the, the wise man. We've talked about a lot of different things. And so this morning, uh, my topic was, was Jesus in the book of Proverbs. And so as I began to look at this, I began to look at it in a different way. And so the morning, this morning, the title of my message is Wisdom Chooses Jesus. Wisdom Chooses Jesus. So you had Jesus here talking to the religious leaders and the Pharisees, and he was talking to them about Jonah, who uh, you know, didn't want to preach to Nineveh because of what they were doing. And, and it made a lot of sense why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, because they were persecuting and killing his people. I mean, to the point to where uh, one of the ways that they would uh, 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 execute them is they would take a pole and they would chisel it up to a point like a pencil, and they would set their enemies on that and they would tie weights around their feet until it impaled them and killed them. And so could you imagine that being done to your people? And so Jonah didn't want to go when God asked him to go. And we know what happened there and God got his attention and he went. And when he told the, the king and began to tell the nation, it said that all of the city gave their life to the or Really, all the city repented. They all covered themselves and they repented to God. Listen, if there was ever an evangelist in the Bible, Jonah would be the evangelist I'd like to be because an entire city gave their heart and life back to God through his preaching. And so Jesus is telling them, listen, I'm here. Jesus was living out the scriptures and working the miracles in front of them, but they still didn't want to believe. He talks about Queen of Sheba, of Sheba who came to King Solomon for his wisdom because God had made him the wisest king that ever lived. And now Jesus, the Messiah, God himself, the source and fountain of all wisdom was in front of them and they wouldn't listen. So the question this morning is, how many times can we find ourselves in that same place? That Jesus is right in front of us. He's calling us. He's longing for us. And we fail to recognize what he's saying and the signs that he's doing in our lives. Why do we miss him sometimes? Because obvious truths often escape an unnoticed eye. Let me say it again. Obvious truths often escaped an unnoticed eye because sometimes we're so busy in what we are doing in life and what we think about things and how we're, we're, we're you know, taking it upon ourselves to, to do things is that we're missing Jesus when he's right in front of us and he's trying to speak to us. He's trying to call us, but we're so busy that we fail to hear that. We fail to see it. And so this morning, I'm going to be a lot in the book of John, and there's seven I am statements that Jesus talks about himself in the book of John. One is, he says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. The other, he says, I'm the gate. He says, I'm the bread, I'm the resurrection, I'm the light of the world, and I'm the vine. And the one that I want to focus on today is another one that he said when he said, I am the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. They all have different meanings, but that's the one I want to focus on this morning. So John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. 
Now think about that. Jesus is saying, I'm the good shepherd. Listen, he wants to see our life successful. He wants us to see us living a, a, a successful life. Not that life is not hard. Anybody ever had a hard day? Hard week? <laughs> Month? Year? How many times have I heard at the end of the year somebody say, I'm so glad 2023 is over with. It's a brand new fresh start this year. Well, that's a year of trials, <laughs> it sounds like. But we know we're going to have heartaches. We know we're going to have trials in life. Even Jesus said that. You're going to have trials. But listen, there is someone there who loves us and is ready to guide you and I in these trials of life. Someone that's not going to give up on you. Someone that's not going to turn away from you. But someone who is there that is longing for you because he loves you so much. Wisdom will say, that's what I want in my life. Wisdom will say, I need that in my life. He's not here to harm us. John 10, 1 says this, I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a shepherd fold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. John 10, 10 says, the thief's purpose, purpose is to kill, steal, and destroy. Oh, but here we go. Jesus said, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Isn't that amazing? Jesus says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Why? Because he loves us. Sometimes, you know, we harden ourselves to think that we don't need this Savior. I can handle this. I know what I need to do. I've, I've been down this road before. And then we all of a sudden begin to take on wisdom of ourselves instead of the wisdom that Jesus has. And we can begin to find ourselves in a place that we shouldn't be. Some people say, I'm a self-made man. You know, I shared this in my anchor class. I had a, an uncle of mine who uh, was a very successful uh, um, gentleman in the, in the town he was in, uh, the mayor of the town, going into politics, all these different things, very uh, uh, financially successful. And one day uh, he came down with throat cancer. He had smoked cigars all his life and got throat cancer. And so the only person in my life that I knew was a true believer was my granny. And so she said, I'm going to put you on our prayer chain at church so that we'll pray that God will help you through this. And he said, don't put me on your prayer chain at church. I don't want your prayers. I don't need your prayers. Everything that I've done in life, I've done. Not this God you talk about. I've made myself. I've been successful because I've worked hard. And all of a sudden, his heart was so hardened to what uh, she was trying to tell him, that he was a self-made man. But he was missing out on the best thing in his life that he could have had. Listen, sheep need a shepherd, right? Just like we need Jesus. So what does the good shepherd do? That's the question this morning. Number one, he guides. Psalms 23, 3. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Just like a shepherd guides his sheep around, just as he's trying to keep them in a place of safety and, and to uh, make sure that nothing happens to those sheep. Listen, Jesus doesn't guide them into harm. How many of you have ever seen a shepherd take his sheep to the wolves' den and walk off and leave them? That wouldn't be very smart, would it? That's not what a shepherd does. His job is to protect those sheep that he's caring for, his flock. And he loves them so much and they love him. They know him by name or they know him, know him by his voice, all these different things. And here's Jesus and he doesn't want to lead you into harm. John 10, 3 through 4 says, The gatekeeper opens the gate for the shepherd, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. Think about this, this scripture here. The God that created the universe, the God that put the stars in their place and knows them by name. Do you know what the word says right there? That that God knows my name. 
He knows your name. Isn't that amazing? That that God would know you so intimately. He says he knows the hairs that are numbered on your head. He knows when you're walking through a trial. He knows with the tears that you cry. That's who Jesus is. I learned years ago that God knows how to subtract. (laughs) Because mine kept falling out. But how amazing is it to know that that God knows me and that he cares for me and that he loves me. God calls my name and he leads me out. Listen, his job is to guide and mine is to follow. That's what it is. His job is to guide and lead us through the trials of life, through the great moments of life, through the turbulent times in our life. But my job is to begin to know who he is and recognize the love that he has for me and what he wants for my life. And my job is to follow him. Number two, he provides. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. I lack nothing, right? Listen, God knows your needs. He's there to provide for you. Now listen, there's a huge difference between needs and wants. Okay, right? Everybody understand that. There's a need and then there's a want. So when my middle son son was little, He would watch Nickelodeon or the cartoon channels. And every time an infomercial would come on TV, he'd come running to our room and go, Mommy, 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 you need this. It's on TV. You have to have this. And then we would have to explain to him that that wasn't something we really needed. Maybe it was something we wanted. (laughs) But to him, it didn't make sense. This is an amazing product. You got to have it in your life. I've seen God time and time again take care of the needs in my life. He didn't always give me the bass boat or the hunting lease or the different things that I wanted. But you know what? I always had food on my table. I had my lights on. I had a roof over my head. I remember uh, I used to work at the railroad and... I would have to drive 45 minutes into downtown Houston to the ship channel to work. And the church that I served at was 45 minutes north of where I worked. And so I, uh, I knew exactly, okay, because listen, I'm a youth pastor this time, just starting out. The railroad didn't really, the way our contract was designed when you first started with the railroad, you didn't make a whole lot of money. So I knew exactly how much gas I needed to get to work and how much I needed to get to church and how long, how much it took me to get home. And so I remember the night before when I pulled in, I had a paycheck coming, but it was two days away. I had not a penny to my name and my, my fuel tank was on a quarter of a tank. And I remember going, okay, I got to go to work tonight or I got to go to church tonight. And then I've got to come home and then I've got to turn around and I've got to go back to work and come home. I don't have enough gas because it was sitting right at a quarter of a tank and I knew I needed about a quarter and a half. So I was like, okay. So my first thought was, well, I'll just call my pastor and I'll tell him, hey, I can't make it tonight. And then I got to thinking about it. I, there, I had a lot of responsibility in that church. I was teaching a Royal Ranger class and the kids that I was mentoring and I talked to them the week before about what we were going to speak on. Isn't it funny how when trials come, sometimes the first things we'll give up are the things of God. To walk into the things of the world that we think will provide. But that's where I was at. And I finally said, I can't do that. I've got responsibilities. I've told these, these kids, I've, I've told my pastor, I'm going. And so as I'm walking out, I'm still thinking about this. I'm still churning. I'm a, I'm a brand new Christian. And, and I'm like, how is this going to work? I just don't know how this is going to work. And all of a sudden, a story came to my mind. Do you remember when God kept the oil burning for 40 days? I walked over to my vehicle and I placed my hand on it. And I said, God, I don't have enough gas to get to church, to get home, and to get to work and get home. And there's nothing I can do. I'm putting this in your hands. Would you take care of me? I jumped in my truck, I went to church, I came home, I changed, got ready, went to work that night, worked all night, came home, got home that morning, and when I pulled in my driveway, I had a quarter tank of gas. Isn't, oh 
our God amazing. Amen. Amen. The things that seem impossible to us, God can do. God is the God of the impossible. But we have to be willing and trust and know that we'll put our faith and we'll listen and we'll follow wherever he is leading us. Wherever he's going, he's not going to leave you and walk away. The scripture says he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Listen, that shepherd that does that. Listen, sheep won't lie down if they're hungry, if there's tension, if they're afraid, if there's anxiety. They won't lay down. Sheep don't like to drink when water's rushing. He leads me beside the still waters. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? When you know you're going to be taken care of, you can rest easy. When you know someone's going to take care of you, you can rest easy. Think about that growing up as a child. Did you worry about the bills? Did you worry about what food was going to be on the table? No, you didn't. Why? Because you had parents that were going to take care of you. That were going to give you those things. That's who Jesus is in our lives. He's that one that wants to take care of you. That wants to provide for you. But he's just looking at you to say, you know what? I believe in you and I trust you with my life. And I'll give it to you. The last thing this morning is he protects Psalms 23, 4 through 6 says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love, I will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a beautiful picture. That staff and that rod he has, there's a, there was some of the, a few of the things that a staff was used for. It was used in drawing a, a sheep together. So as they're herding them around and a sheep would kind of get out of a line, what would the shepherd do? He'd take that stick and he'd reach over and, he, and he'd touch them and he'd press them and he'd push them back over into the crowd to keep them all together. That's the same thing he does with us is that when we begin to all of a sudden look at the world or look at our own uh, way of doing things and we begin to get out of line, you know what Jesus does? He comes and he takes that staff and he gently begins to nudge and pull and push us back into an intimate relationship with him. Another thing that it was used for is He would use his staff to gently lift a newborn lamb and bring it to its mother if they were separated. He did this because he was afraid if he picked it up with his hands that his smell would get on it and that ooh would would, would reject the child. So he'd use that staff to bring it over to its mother. He also used the staff for guiding the sheep through a new gate or along a dangerous, difficult road. He would use the slender stick and press it gently against the animal's side. And this pressure guided the sheep in the way that the owner wants it to go. Thus, the sheep are reassured of its proper path. And that's what he does with you and I. Through his word, through prayer, through seeking him, is that he'll reach out and he'll gently push you back to where we're supposed to be. The rod that he had was used to fight the enemy. When we choose the good shepherd and we walk through these trials of life, he's there to fight the enemy and to go before us. He wants to guide us into safety. So many times we get lost in, oh, well, I've got I've to defend myself or I've got to get back or I've got to make this thing right. Just give it to God. Quit trying to carry that weight on your shoulders of, of what you think you should do and understand that God has got you. That he's got this situation. How many times have I been in a place in my life where I finally said, God, I can't do anything. And I'm finally going to ask you, would you do this for me? And do you know what? Things would begin to happen at that moment. But the problem was, is that I try to take it on my shoulders for too long and figure it out myself. And sometimes when we begin to do that, we find ourselves in a place where (laughs) we come to the rock bottom and the only thing we have to do is to look up for God and say, I'm in a place where I can't do it. 
Luke 15, 4 through 6 says, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. The shepherd will go after you, looking for you till he finds you. If you don't know who this Savior is and you don't know who Jesus is, I'm telling you, he's trying to find you. We sing this song, Reckless Love. And when it first came out, my, uh, my theological side said, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. God doesn't have a reckless love. I don't understand that. But then as I began to look at the song and I began to, to realize and look at it through human eyes, isn't it crazy that God would leave these 99 in an open field and go to find that one that's lost? To go to find that one that that's, could be in trouble or about to be devoured by the enemy, uh, the, the wolves and the things that are out there. And he would say, you know what? I'm going to leave these over here, but I'm going to go out and I'm going to trek and I'm going to find that one. That's who we are. We were that one, or maybe we're still that one, that we're finding ourselves away from God and we're lost and we're not sure what to do. I want you to know this morning is that Jesus is coming after you. He's looking for you. And it takes us to say, okay, you know what? Here I am, God, and I will follow you back to where I'm supposed to be. I remember years ago when I was a kid, a little bit different time. So every time I would stay with my grandparents, I would uh, get up that morning, I'd grab my shotgun and I'd grab my fishing pole and I was gone until dark. I'd go out and shoot things, some things I wasn't supposed to, but I shot a lot of things. And then I'd go and find the, the ponds and I'd fish and I just, I just loved it. So I remember one time we went to my great uncle's house and I had never been out there before. He had a big farm and uh, I, I grabbed, you know, I've got to take my shotgun and my fishing pole because he had little ponds and, and man, I take off and I'm gone. And all of a sudden, toward later evening, I'm, I'm kind of trying to figure out where I'm at, and, I, and I, couldn't, I couldn't figure out where I was, and I started to get lost. And so at first, I'm like, okay, you know, I, I have no idea how at a kid I could go off in the woods for hours upon hours and still find my way home, but this time I couldn't. And so I started getting nervous, and I started getting afraid. I'm like, what am I going to do, you know? And then all of a sudden, it started getting dark. And now I'm really scared. What, if I have to spend the night out here, what am I going to do? Where am I going to stay? You know, what am I going to sleep? And all of a sudden, this fear began to boil up in me. And I was getting so afraid. And then all of a sudden, you know what I heard? I heard my papa's voice. Josh! Josh! I'm over here, papa. I'm over here. But that first moment when he hollered my name, that fear just... Because I knew he was going to find me. I knew that I wasn't going to be left out there alone. That's what Jesus is doing for you and I. He's calling your name. He's calling your name. And he's just waiting for you to call back. To say, God, here I am. He wants to take that fear and all those things that you're walking through and he wants to begin to melt those things off and wrap his arms around you and let you know, I am right here. And I've got you. I've got you. But wisdom is when we understand that. Wisdom is when we try, try to Quit doing it on our own and realizing that we need a Savior. And what He's did on the cross for you and I. Wisdom shows us that choosing Jesus is the best thing that we can ever do. Amen. Would you pray with me this morning? Bow your heads and just close your eyes right there. Father, here we are this morning. And God, you know exactly where we're at. And Lord, this morning, I pray that we would begin to understand the true love that you have for us. Father, that you're not leaving us by ourselves. You're not walking away from us. But God, you're searching for us. 
Whether that's we find you for the first time or whether we've just strayed off the path some, but you're there to just re- uh, gently reach out and to push us back into the path that we're supposed to be. God, with all the struggles of life, with the things that we walk through, God, there's moments where we find ourselves straight off the path and we just wonder, where were we? How did we get here? Lord, I found myself there so many times. But the great thing that we have is that we have the word which says, you are faithful and just to forgive those that ask. God, would you remind us here this morning that we're not in this alone. That we're not walking through this life without someone there who has unconditional love and will always be there. God, would you speak that into our hearts this morning? That we're not alone on whatever it is that we're walking through. The loss of something. The job that we're at. The marriage we're in. The struggles of this life. You know. You know. And God, all you're asking is for us to just turn and to call back and follow. And when we do, we find that good shepherd that you want to be in our lives. This morning, right where you're at, it's just you and the Lord and you're praying. And this morning you could say, you know what, Pastor Josh? This good shepherd, this person you're talking about, I've never really truly known. I've been trying to do this walk on my own. I've been trying to walk through life and, and the best that I can. And I understand that there's nothing wrong with that. But you're in that place this morning where you're like, you know what? I've hit that rock bottom place. I, I just, I need to find him today. I'm tired of where I'm headed and where I'm going. And I need God today to come into my life and to rescue me. I've never had that before. And I don't understand it, but I'm willing to give him a chance. That's you in this place. And you can say, Pastor Josh, I've I've never known Jesus in this way. But today I want to give him a chance. I'm tired of doing this on my own. Would you just lift your hand? I want to pray with you. Anybody in the house today? Maybe you're in here this morning and you can say, you know what, Pastor Josh, I I know who Jesus is, but the things of this life, the the job, the the family, all the stuff that I've been walking through, everything is just begin to push me off a little bit from where I used to be. And I now find myself in a place where I'm just like, how, where am I? And I just want to come back today. I just want to come back to that place where God wraps me in his arms and I know that he's right there in front of me and I will follow him all my days. Just gotten a little confused, a little distracted. In these trials that I'm walking through, I need him to help me walk out. If that's you in this place today and you say, you know what, Pastor Josh, I'm just in a place where I've been walking through the trials and these storms of life and I need God just to come and to wrap his arms around me this morning. I need God to whisper in my ear that it's going to be okay. I need God to call out my name. If that's you, would you just lift your hand in this place? Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you for all these hands, Lord. Father, you see us and you know us. And God, I thank you this morning, Father, that we can come back to you at any moment. And all we have to say is, God, here I am. I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? And God, wrap your arms around me and lead me out of this trial. I'm tired of walking through it on my own. Call my name. Call my name. Father, you see every hand that was raised. Father, you know every heart that longs for you and cries out for you. And this morning, God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will touch them this morning and that you will speak their name. Speak their name. Thank you, Lord, 
for what you're doing in them and through them in Jesus' name. Listen, before we close out service, if you raised your hand this morning, I want to just pray with you. The Bible says that we lay hands on one another, that we bear each other's burdens, and that we pray for one another. You're not in this alone. Jesus is there. And not only that, you have brothers and sisters that are here, that are around you this morning, that want to speak life, that want to pray with you, and want to ask God to begin to move in your life. Listen, if you raised your hand, would you please just come find a place at the altars this morning? And I want to come, and I just want to pray with you. Would you do that? If you lifted your hand, would you come this morning? Could you come down, take that step of faith and just walk down so that we can come together as a body of believers and begin to pray? Would you do that this morning? These altars are going to be open. We're going to begin to pray. They're going to begin to sing. And if you lifted your hand, or maybe you're in here and you didn't lift your hand, but you know you need some prayer, would you come this morning? And let us begin to pray. I'm going to ask the, uh, the clergy and I'm going to ask the, uh, those that, that are a part of that team, would you come and would you gather around these that come to the altar this morning and would you begin to pray?